Thank you, we've been Jack Island. What a fucking good night. Thank you so much, y'all. Yeah. Give us some. Now we can see there's one more on the set list, mate. Encore! Come on, come on lads. Come on. We haven't paid all this money to get in here tonight. Two more songs. Come on. I've come all the way from Ballarat to this shit. It's fucking wild. Wild.
welcome to the Rift Crew. I'm your host, Steve Mitchell, back for another show here in the realm. And joining me as always over in Washington, D.C. I'm not sure on the steps of, cap of the Capitol building, but we'll find out. It's Skull, how are you doing, mate? Greetings, ladies and gentlemen in Cyberland. As you know, this is Skull broadcasting from the past, present, and future in the Chamber of the Cosmos. Here with my good friend, Steve Oz in Ozland. I'm an off-again, on-again D.C. bomb rock band, Black Manta. I've been in the DC scene for over 30 years and know people from all over the scene. As usual, really excited to be here. And also very honored, have a very special guest with us here today, Joe Bouchard, a former a member of BOC is here with us today. And we're really excited to have him. I'm a huge fan. It's a great to be here. Awesome. I have a lot of questions. Like I said, I'm a big fan. So we, we, have, we have a lot to get through. Okay. Yeah, I guess before we dive dive back in, in, into your past, I guess talk about the present because I understand you just sure, sure. from, from Canada with some shows and you're off to Europe. Yes. So, so how was Canada? Canada was fantastic. It was, um, I, we haven't been on the road in about three, four years up there. Mm. And uh, it was, it was pretty cool. Um, unfortunately, I caught COVID. Oh my I'm God! Getting over that now. Um, We've all had it know. now. Me and him, yeah, me and Steve, both have had it. Everybody's got it. You're gonna get it sooner or later. Yep. And uh, but we had a wonderful time, and the shows were fantastic. And the last one was in Toronto, but I, I wasn't feeling that great that day. Mm. Uh, we played a great show. Um, even if I was a little sick, it wasn't bad. But it was a great show at the Elmo Combo, a very famous. Uh, venue in uh, downtown toronto and great crowd great crowd but the next day i tested positive so we had to put off two of our shows which we'll mm. be doing in october so and well, i'm glad um, you're feeling better um yeah i'm uh, feeling good and excited really excited about going to scotland on saturday and then we from there we go to england and a couple of weeks playing some shows in England, including London and Newcastle. And uh, then we're going to, uh, uh, let's see, then we're going to France. We've awesome. got a sold out show in Paris at the Hard Rock Cafe. It's going to be great. And then we're doing a festival in the south of France in Paminade. It's the Tribal Fest which we, we did with another band a, a few years back. But it's always great to be in the south of France ah, sure. in the summertime. Oh, my God. Oh, right. It's beautiful there. So and is so, this all This is all said, Bouchard Brothers stuff? Yeah. This Well, okay. first, uh, Canada was uh, Blue Coop, which is okay. uh, myself and Dennis Dunaway from Alice Cooper and oh. our singers, uh, Tish and Snooky from Manic Panic. Uh, great, great background singers, and uh, yeah, and now the Bouchard brothers are going to rev up for this, uh, you know, 10, 12, 12 shows, something like that, and uh, we just had a meeting today, and getting everything worked out, all the details, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Well, I'm, I'm a huge yeah. fan, um, and I've seen BOC, obviously, I was too young to see you back in the day, but... Um... I've seen him a bunch, but it, it would be great if, are you, are you guys going to tour the States or the East Coast? Uh, possibly, yeah. We're going to see how this one goes. Uh, we, we played a, we played maybe three, four shows doing this format, which is songs and stories, where we play some of cool. the hit songs and we talk, talk how the songs were, uh, what the story behind the songs were, or how, they, how would they were written. And uh, it's, a, it's a fun show because we get, not only we do the hits, we do songs from our solo albums and, sure. uh, and some deep tracks and surprises and stuff we haven't played in a long time. So it's, sure. it's a fun show. And my, my brother and I, we switch off on the lead vocals. And my partner, Joan, uh, plays guitar also in that group. And uh, it's, it's great. Yeah. Well, well, speaking of solo stuff, you have a new album out, American Rocker. Mm -hmm. Yes. You want to talk, talk about that a little bit? I, I watched the uh, single My Way is the Highway, and it, yes. it's great. Yeah, fun. I, sure. the most, I think that's the most fun I've ever had on one of my solo records was 
was my way is the highway but it, it's it's a very autobiographical album i was stuck sure. here this is my pandemic album i was stuck mm-hmm. here at home and you know communing with my instruments you know seeing oh, everybody's man, got one right a pandemic man, album you gotta, you gotta have a pandemic album but it was great because i finally had time to really work on the songs and make sure they were developed and nothing was rushed everything uh, you know and i felt like what well, what should i write about you know and i said well i'll write about the the best times of my life you know being very very reflective about it you know mm-hmm. and it really sort of centered around the 60s and the 70s you know when i was young and i was just getting started with the you know with blue oyster cult and uh, we had these great tours um yeah telling talk just just amazing times you know playing for the fans all over the uh, all over the states and 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 going back in europe and the festivals and in that we did it was fantastic time I, yeah I, well, I, the, I, the, that. It's I mean the, the cool thing is is whenever you hear like it's pretty much any anybody from the band that writes a solo album there, invariably there's going to have that boc thumbprint on it because you got yes. everybody wrote songs everybody yeah, has yeah, has yeah. their own little template their own little vibe yeah and yeah. so I, I hear that in the new stuff too well, thanks thanks uh, you know i i sometimes i try not no, i don't want to make this like a blue oyster cult song you know but sure. you know i was there you i can't you help know, it invented a lot of that stuff it's, it's in, in your DNA. dna you got it exactly yeah man yeah so uh um, I'm, 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 yeah, I'm hoping that, uh, more people hear the album. It's, it's tough these days, you know, where there's so sure. much, you have so many choices, you know, but sure. I promise you, <laughs> you listeners out there, I promise you, you won't be disappointed. This is a good one. You know, I mean, really, really tremendous, uh, you know, uh, performances. And if I do say myself, so myself, you know, being the artist, <laughs> I, I have to like be, I have to wear many hats, you know, I sure. engineer most of it, I produce it, you know, and, and luckily because of my time with uh, different producers that we had during the Blue Oyster Cult era, um, mm. you know, like Martin Birch, he did Deep Purple, Boat, you know, a highway star <laughs> i have some Who questions that? that those those will be coming uh, up later on <laughs> you know and so I'm, I'm i'm producing myself and i'm saying gee well what would martin say <laughs> awesome you know and he was pretty laid back he was one of the more laid back producers that we had and tremendous to work with but it was tom Warman and uh and bruce fairburn even who did mm-hmm. uh you know bon jovi and big records for uh for uh sure. aerosmith yeah those big 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 records so uh you know they and they're all different different personalities and uh I, I i really think back those you know experiences with those people and uh you know sure um, I, you know it's it, it it makes it a lot of fun you know to you're being you're ed, you're, you're educated by them whether you know it or not yeah. just by watching oh, yeah, them and yeah. their their yeah. technique and their skill yeah, and yeah. even the equipment that they use oh yeah yeah sure yeah yeah um i mean yeah. I've, I've i've been in a band too i'm uh, you know not at that level but just being in the studio oh, you know yeah. Yeah. just seeing it happen the little the, percussion the parts that uh tom Warman would put on the record he always he had always had to have, have have a few percussion things little shakers and bells and stuff that, that would be right and, and those ended up even on like motley crew records later on you know after sure. us but to, you know they well, we'll, we'll loop back in on that later on because right. you sure you started talking you started talking about the early days and i wanted to go back to the very mm. beginning real quick because um a lot of people might not know this but there were bands previous to blue oyster cult like uh soft white underbelly a stock mm-hmm. forest group yeah Owaka, even they were it was this very kind of amorphous they were using had all these different yes. names and one of them i have here the stock, stock forest, forest saint cecilia a massive collect- yeah, yeah i'm a massive collector I, I was in college when they recorded that I that's why i was going to ask you what yeah. 
Well, tell us how why you well, weren't there at the very beginning. Well, um, when Albert and I started way back when we were in junior high school, we had this mm -hmm. great band. Um, it, it was a fun band. It lasted for like six years. Usually those sort of teen bands only last for a year or two, you know. But we, uh, we, we, we played everywhere, and we won the Battle of the Bands. It was just like School of Rock, where they go to the big Battle of the Bands in the sure. big city, and, and we won first place. And was like, wow, that's pretty cool, you know? And, what, what were you guys uh, called? We were called the Regal Tones. The Regal, the Regal Tones. Tones. Very doo-wop. <laughs> very, very 60s, very right. early 60s. Yeah. So... Um, yeah, and you know, we we actually had a reunion in two thousand six, forty year hmm. reunion. It was in, it was incredible, uh, and I just saw the the guys a couple of weeks ago. Some of the guys came to our show, uh, a festival we did in upstate New York. Uh, so after high school, Albert, being a year older than me, he went off to college, hmm. and that's where he met Buck Dharma. Who was known as Don Roser back then, you know, mm -hmm. a long ways off from Buck Dharma, but he was Don Roser and he was one hell of a guitar player. That's one thing I really remember. Albert would bring like demo recordings from his college band, and I said, "Wow, the guitar is incredible." So that was uh, that was early days of of Don Roser, um, and I, so I and I went out to another college. Uh, I went to a music school, was studying music education. And I was a piano major. Uh, I wanted to be a guitar major, but there was no place to study guitar in 1966. So mm. I ended up being a piano major. So I was following, Albert was doing this thing with Don in uh, New York called the Soft White Underbelly, mm. and which became Stock Forest. And, and for a long time, you know, I, they had a deal with Electra Records. They... People at Electra thought they were going to be the new Doors. Oh yeah, like yeah, yeah. East oh, yeah. Coast version of the Doors, mm -hmm. kind of jammy. They had that. They could do the solos, the long solos, and and they had this singer that did the psychological, you know, voodoo craziness. Le Le Les, that right? Was Les, Les Bronstein. Right. Yeah, You're right. Yeah. So I was, I was a fan. I was like listening to all these things they'd have, have demo recordings and they've have, have what they called acetates they bring acetates mm, sure. which are the old plastic uh, you know you can only play them like 10 times and then they completely dissolve but that's how you you tested your pressings you know you did mm. a test pressing and uh, they would bring them you know and then i started going in my, in my my college vacations which were pretty generous in those days I would go down to the band house and I lived at the band house, you know, through the whole vacation. We'd go into the city, we'd be, we'd be jamming in their basement, you know, and I'd be playing along and, you know, uh, well, for, so for the listeners out there, well. they, they, for the they listeners, that was all in New York, right? Yeah. New York, Long Island, actually in Great Neck. Long Island. Island. And, and where, where was your school? Uh, Ithaca College in Ithaca. Ithaca. Yeah, okay, so right both in New York by, State. Yeah, I got you. by uh, Cornell and beautiful place to go to school. I was I played in so many different bands. I, um, I you know I made a lot of money actually when I was in college because you could do three <laughs> four gigs a weekend. Met a lot of like, chicks. Uh, don't talk about the chicks. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> It was the 60s, oh, the college right? girls, the college girls, ah, oh, those days. Yeah. yeah, it was the 60s. It was a beautiful time. But yeah. I learned a lot. And, you know, uh, and in the meantime, I kept waiting for this Soft One Underbelly or Stock Forest album, you know, because they changed their name. And, mm -hmm. and, but the album never came out. So finally, I graduated from college. I, I knew I was going to go to New York. And, and work in music one way or another you know that was my mm -hmm. goal and i get a call from my brother in the middle of the night three o'clock in the morning and he calls me up and says hey we need a bass player we need it right away we're doing a tour with led zeppelin we're, the tour yeah we it, wow it's going to start you know as soon as you can get here so 
I finished my summer job. I was out on uh, Martha's Vineyard working in a theater, actually, working doing theater music. And so I said, yeah, I'll be right there as soon as I... So I, Labor Day weekend, I drive to Long Island, the worst traffic I've ever had in my whole life, that, you know, that weekend coming back from, from Cape Cod. So uh, I get there, and I say, I'm ready for the tour. Let's do it. And he said, ah, well... Zeppelin decided they didn't want an opening act, and that's the way they did it. You know, they did a few shows with opening act in the very mm. early days, but after that, Peter Grant, the manager, said, "No, we're going to just do." Because I was going to say, I don't remember reading anywhere that you guys ever opened for no. Led Zeppelin. <laughs> in fact, somebody put up a fake, fake festival, and there was Led Zeppelin with Blue Oyster Cult as the opening nice. act. It was a fake. Fest. It was a fake uh, sure, sure. poster. I just saw it this morning. And I said, hey, 1969? No, that didn't happen. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah, and then a week later, we get a telegram from uh, Electra Records. It was an old-fashioned telegram. Telegram for sure, telegram underbelly. Sam. Yeah, telegram. They gave us a telegram. And it said, you're off the label. Oh, said, shit. What? You know, I just got here. They didn't give me a chance. Mm. They didn't have any idea who I was, I'm sure. Mm. But that, you know, since we were off the label, then I said, well, okay, we're going to make this thing work, you know. And I'm I'm happy to join the band. And, you know, it was just. Well, they already had a taste of it. So they knew that yeah, they, they could had, make yeah, it. They, yeah. And their manager, Sandy, he mm. was a, a journalist with uh, Crawdaddy Magazine. The mm. early, before right. there was Rolling Stone, there was Crawdaddy, and they were, they were, they wanted to uh, take and make uh, rock and roll, uh, inter, you know, as serious as as classical music. They they really wanted to uh, up, you know, up level, you know, raise the level of art in rock music. So sure. that was Sandy's thing, and so he met a lot of the record company people. He'd be going mm. to press parties all the time. So he had the connections. And, uh, you know, a couple of months we did we did all kinds of sh sh cover gigs and, you know, anything we could get to pay the rent. And um, finally we made some demos and Sandy shopped the demos around and uh, Columbia was interested, you know. It took a while. I, I think it took about a year that I was in the band a year. And we, what we did is we, uh, we upgraded some of our, um, our songs that we had for uh, Stock Forest Group, say. Mm -hmm, we, mm -hmm. we, we made them heavier. And, and Sandy kept saying, you know, you know that, that, that hippy-dippy stuff that you're playing, it's, it's kind of dying on the vine. What you want to do is more like Deep Purple, Black Sabbath, You're a right. Heap. The heavy bands, you know. Right. I'm the, and, the American Black Sabbath. Yes, yes. In fact, Sandy took me down to a theater in um, Staten Island. It was a little movie theater, and the, the act was Black Sabbath. This is the first time I wow. seen Black Sabbath. Yeah. It was like maybe the first two weeks I was in the band. And he says, yeah, this is, you know. And it was, So what was, was that Ozzy. like? That must have blown your mind. Yeah, well, it was it was heavy rock, you know. It was like Helter Skelter, you know. I mean, the Beatles had done a little bit of that, and That's the true. Zeppelin had done some some stuff That's like true. that. That's true. But I think Black Sabbath was the first band to do all that, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, they had a couple of sweet instrumentals, you know, and and most bands end up doing a variety of stuff, but they were pretty heavy, and uh, it. I was happy to have a job. I'll do that stuff. I can do that in my sleep. <laughs> right. Sure. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so, and then, uh, let's see, what else? We went to see Alice Cooper. Hmm. And that really changed things around. Because I had heard the rumor about Alice Cooper. Like, oh, they're, they're weird. They're, they're just... You know they're sick and they, they're, they're freaks. The music, the freak, and the music's all over the ear. That so we went to see Alice Cooper. It was the total opposite. It was tight. 
it was it was like and then it was had a whole story to it you know and he hangs himself at the end and then he comes back to life like all the theatrics thought right. of that? who ever yeah. thought of that you know and yeah. then like a couple months later we went out on a tour with the birds we went okay. and it was sponsored by columbia records because columbia had the birds and the uh, opening act was this unknown uh, jazz fusion group called Mahavishnu Orchestra. Nice. And uh, yeah, they were, it was their first show ever. First night, they weren't too good. Second night, they got a lot better. The third <laughs> night, like, holy crap, they're incredible, you know. Yeah. So, you know. I they're, on, that, they're, that band, they're on a completely different level. A different level. Band. Hey, I'm going to jump ahead. 40 years, 50 years, and uh, I just did a recording with the drummer from Mahavishnu, from Billy, Billy Cobham. Billy Cobham, yeah. Nice. It was, this This is insane, because I am luck, a, a lucky guy, I must say, a very lucky guy. I get the email out of the blue from Cleopatra Records, a company in uh, Las Vegas or, Saint, or Los Angeles, and they're doing a tribute to Pink Floyd. Would you like mm. to play bass? I said, sure, you know. And it's Animal's album, great album, you know. And uh, the, uh, the drummer is going to be Billy Cobham. The guitar player is Al DiMiola. Okay. <laughs> the the, uh, the, uh, the uh, a keyboard player from Yes. And the okay. singer from Dream Theater. So I, they sent me a track, and I, I'm working in my right here in the studio, working in the studio, you know, to get the bass, you know, so it was just really tight, you know. And then about six months later, it comes out, and it's doing great. It's, it blew my mind because Al, I love Al, Al DiMio mm -hmm. as a guitar player, and he plays these solos that are not Pink Floyd. They are Al Demiola. He's not he's not imitating uh, David Gilmour. He's so doing anyway, his style. to see my name on a record with Billy Cobham, Al Demiola, uh, uh very cool. Baraz from Yes and and it sounds great and you know got great reviews and it's doing fantastic on streaming. So uh you know and they want me to do not another one with the with the ba with the band from yes the, the the bass player from yes the current bass player from yes so i'll be doing another one of those uh probably coming out in about six months so you know even though it seems like nothing is happening i'm doing great <laughs> that's <laughs> you know, cool man the solo album's doing really well i get to play these guest spots on different albums you know and um yeah yeah. Well, as so far anyway, as like, we'll go back fifty years, back to we'll go back days. 50, we'll go back in our time. Uh, I had back to jump back. Well, I was talking about Mama Vishnu. We were sure. we were great friends with Billy and John McLaughlin and and uh, the keyboard player. You know, uh, Miami Vice keyboard player. Um, oh, Jan Hammer. Jan, yeah, Jan yeah. 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 was Jan and uh, Jerry Goodman on the electric violin and and then the birds. But the problem was. Everybody wanted to hear Mr. Tambourine Man. They didn't want to hear any heavy music. They didn't, you know. So when we got to open the show, we got a couple months later, we, you know, we said, we got to do something we, we, that, that's a little more uh, more contemporary, you know, more exciting, you know. Mm -hmm. So we got to open the show for Alice Cooper. And like, this was like, all our friends would tell us, well, you got to be able to help fit into the music business, you know. And then we saw Alice Cooper says, these guys don't fit in at all. <laughs> They're just right. like totally from They're another doing whatever planet. They, want. they can do whatever they want. So that was inspiring to us. And I mm -hmm. still play with Dennis Dunaway. And he's been, I've been playing with Dennis for three decades. And you know, we just, just came back from this tour of Canada. Uh, my brother plays the drums and Dennis plays the bass and, have a great time we've put out three studio albums and um and that's just a sideline there's the solo stuff and and now the bouchard brothers thing is kicking off so let me think so we did the we did the alice cooper tour and and our first album had just coming out had just come out 
and we started uh, to get some some certain pockets of the country started being interested in Blue Oyster Cult. It might have been the the weird album cover. We didn't have any pictures of us. The weird that. name. The weird name. Like, yeah. you know, hey, you know, so there was a place down in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And there's this one record store that sold like thousands of our albums, you know. Mm. And they just, there's one guy there that says, hey, you got to get this new album. It's it's a mind blower, you know. So He was uh, turning everybody was, on. Turning everybody on. And that's how it, it, it just, it was word of mouth, you know. Word of mouth. It wasn't something that was going to be played on AM radio, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so we, we put out that album. Then the, that was doing what well, that was do, did good enough for Columbia to re re up our contract for a second album, and that oh one you only signed even, just for the first just for the one. Well, I thought it was like seven album deal, but then again, if it didn't sell at all, mm, it would oh, be a sure. one album deal. <laughs> sure, so, sure. So they they I think they saw how hard we worked on the road too. We were we were touring all is every place and any place we could play you know we did uh you know well there, there's the old funny story that, that very few bass players are actual bass players they start off as guitar players but you seem to be you didn't seem to mind too much you were like oh i don't care what well, i played no know, knowing how good donald was sure is is how good he is there was no reason for me to have to play guitar i eventually i ended up playing a few guitar parts here and there but but right. uh you know donald is is world class you know as a guitarist yeah you're and you're I more than i happy knew as a bass. as a bass player between albert's uh uh feel and don what donald needed to you know to get that sound of his guitar out there i felt like mm -hmm. I, oh i know what this band needs you know so i just right. played Fairly simple parts when it came for me to, you know, stretch out a little bit. I would add, you know, my flair and, you know, and, you know, and then I, I started writing songs. They, they surprised, surprisingly to me, they liked my songs. So we, we ended up recording quite a few over the years. And I still yeah, there's, those um, yeah, I have a couple of my own favorites, uh, mm -hmm. like screams off the first one. Um, and I know you, you co-wrote or co-wrote, um, but that's one of them, OD'd on Life Itself, Hot mm -hmm. Rails to Hell, Seven Screen. Yeah, Disney Hot Rails Busters. to Hell was, about, was my signature song for like 20 years. The signature, uh, yeah, um, that, that one was sort of done in a, was a, kind of written, uh, it, was a, it was a really confusing time for me. I was just adjusting to life in the big city, you know and uh and taking the subway taking mm. the subway into new york city our the guy who did the artwork for our album his name was bill gallick nobody knows where bill gallick is today it's a mystery but <laughs> well his first two album covers are incredible i know he he lived in the house and we were great friends he lived in our band house so he says let's go into the city and uh go see a jazz concert and i forget who the guy was it was the guy who played three saxophones at one time so that whole idea of hot rails to hell was taken fr from this journey into the city now he had a car but he didn't want to park in the city he didn't want to spend two dollars to park now it cost you fifty dollars to park Sure. But back then it was two dollars. So he says, "We'll leave the car in Queens. We'll get on the subway, and then we'll take it up to uh, Lincoln Center where the jazz concert was." And we went to the concert. It was great, and, you know. And coming back on the subway, I see these, the you know, it's all graffitied, you know, 1970s style. That graffitied subway, you know, big king it was like king, and then it was like 1277. So I wrote this in my book. My my notebook is twelve seven seven King, you know, and and I sort of like just put this twelve seven seven Express to Heaven, you know, speeding along. <laughs> this guy, uh, Phil King, was our agent, and unfortunately, he he came to a, a tragic ending, he over mm -hmm. a gambling debt, 
Okay, so but he was a crazy guy, and he lived in the house too. So anyway, I'm thinking about this, dude. How how <laughs> how, um, how I got sort of got wrapped up in it, and and sort of just came right out. I didn't really spend a lot of time writing that song. It was just you know grabbing some words from my notebook and and wanting to do a hard rock song, and that's how that came together. And uh, yeah, and the subway, and, and we were we were rehearsing the song in our in our band house. And the, our manager comes in and says, wow, that sounds like hot rods to hell. And then we told him the story. It was about the subway. He says, oh, it should be hot rails to hell. So the 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 title hot rails to hell came from our manager, Sandy Perlman. I owe him. <laughs> but he, but you know, he didn't, I said to Sandy a lot because he wrote a lot of the early lyrics. He wrote Cities mm -hmm. on Flame with Rock and Roll, you know, and uh, he wrote Astronomy, which I later co-wrote with him. And uh, I said, Sandy, write me some lyrics. I don't know if my lyrics are good enough. And he says, I love what you do. So, you know, that was, that was, that was kind of, you know, very encouraging, you know, for I'm, I'm just a kid from a farm in upstate New York, you know, <laughs> who moved to the, the big city, you know, to see if we, I could, you know, have a music career. And he says, no, I love what you do. Just don't, you just, I'm not, don't change anything. I said, okay, you know. That's so funny. That, I was gonna a couple a couple of my other picks were Nosferatu. Yeah. And Vin, yeah, and you know, obviously, like the one of the most famous ones is Astronomy. Yes. That um, you co-wrote. That to me, yeah. that that could be that could also be your signature song. It's it's a yeah an amazing song. It was covered by Metallica in the late nineties. How good is that? Yeah. And that was huge uh, for you guys on that Garage yeah. Inc. Yeah. album. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. that basically opened you up to a whole yeah. new, uh, you know, demographic, a whole new generation yeah. of kids and people. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. And that's a, that's a fantastic song. Yeah, I went to see Metallica. This was about 1995. And uh, just ma managed to get, like, one of the real good passes. So I'm backstage. And... Uh, uh, they they did this incredible show. Yeah, I don't know. In the 1995 Metallica show was great. The the whole stage collapse, and you know, you see the, you've probably seen that thing where they the, the stage just completely. And then they say, no, we've got to keep playing. So they bring out just like a drum set that's flat on the stage and some some work lights, and they then they rip into this like power punk, you know, set. Uh, you know, their encore set is like incredible. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm wandering around backstage, you know, and I see this guy walking up the hall. You know, everybody's in the catering room that had passes, but I had the good pass. So I'm walking down the thing, and it's Jason Newstead. I said, Jason, it's Joe Bouchard. Yeah, I loved your set. And he, he grabs my hand. He wouldn't, he wouldn't let go. <laughs> he grabs my hand. He wouldn't let go. Yeah, it was it was a great show. Okay, yeah, <laughs> but he wouldn't let go of my hand. So I said, uh, "Come on up the catering room. There's a there's a bunch of people that want to see it, and I will introduce you to the room." So you know, we we t I brought him up there, and there were some of my friends from the guitar workshop that I worked with, and. And everybody's just, you know, so happy to see him. The other guys took off. They, we didn't see, uh, I didn't see uh, Lars or James that night. But uh, they were so nice, you know. Uh, you know, first of all, well, give me the passes to get, to see the show. And great seats, you know, in the perfect spot in the, in the uh, arena. And, uh, well, and two years funny. later, two years later, they put the song on the album. And I'd yeah. say, I said to myself, you know, I should go backstage more often. <laughs> I should go meet the guys in other bands, you know, because I don't like to impose, you know, push my weight around and say, oh, I got to go see, uh, you know, Aerosmith or, you know. No, you know, even though I know them and they're friends of mine, you know, I don't push my weight. But for some reason, I said I should go see Metallica. And two years later, they put the song on the album. This is a song called Apocalypse.
I wanted to talk about this album, this live, oh. the live one. Yes. And Great. this is the this is the legacy edition, which comes with the, the DVD. Oh, and nice. I'm got I'm about nice. to propose. I haven't seen that. I don't have one. Oh, you haven't seen it yet? No. All right. Well, I'm that. a bit of a musical historian. I uh -huh. love music. I have over I have thousands of artifacts in my chamber of the cosmos here, the CDs, mm. vinyl, etc. Yeah, you got it. And so gotta have I, it I put a bit of pieces of the puzzle together. And over the years, something jumped out at me when I watched that. And I don't know if anyone has ever said this. This is my own personal theory. This is my own that, that I've, I've developed myself, but um, so I don't, uh, if this is out there, I don't know, you might already know about this, but um, this is my theory and it's mm -hmm. a bit of a mind blower. Okay. So I was watching that and you should go back and watch it and you have a bass solo on it. Oh yeah. And yeah. it's amazing. It's really intense and it's heavy and it's proto metal or whatever you want because it's 78. <laughs> it's pre all of that stuff by about four or five years. And yeah. it's really intense and wild and you're, you're just, you're going for it. And well, when I was, when I was watching that, a couple of light bulbs went off because there, there's an interview, there's several interviews from Cliff Burton back in the eighties. Oh. And he, when he was a kid, he saw all the rock bands like everyone else did in the West coast. And he was like, mm. I saw this band. I saw that band, you know? And he said, I saw Blue Oyster Cult when I was a kid in like 78 or 79. And a huge light bulb went off. He and I was saw like, that Holy show. Shit. He yeah. saw the show. He saw that tour. He saw your bass solo. And then if you go and you listen to this album, there's a song on here called Anesthesia Pulling Teeth, oh, which oh, is I a know, bass I know that, solo. I know that track. I know that track. With some you listen band. to it and yeah. you listen to your bass solo, hmm. you will be, your mind will be blown. Hmm. I could not believe it. I was putting all these little pieces of the puzzle together and I was like, holy shit. Joe Bouchard influenced Cliff Burton to write this this song. Yeah. And like I said, that's my own personal theory. Whenever I'm listening to music, I always keep these little tidbits well, of information in my brain. To be honest, number one, I didn't write a solo. Uh, I, I improvised a solo. They weren't all that good. <laughs> <laughs> some well, this is amazing. Be, the, some nights they would be, well, no, it's okay. But I did, and I, and I would like uh, try to make it m melodic, but also to have aggressive, you know, stance to it. Very and, aggressive. Uh, um, you know, a lot of the chord stuff is stuff that I borrowed from Dennis Dunaway, Malice Cooper, mm. you know. And he influenced me a lot and still does. Still does. Mm. It's crazy. <laughs> And um, and uh, also another thing is um, I didn't put any effects on the bass. That was yeah, our super sound clean. Man. Yeah. yeah, that was our sound man, George. Any effects that you hear, uh, we we had a we still do actually even to this day. He's he's out there in Idaho or somewhere, and he's uh, remixing some of the rehearsal tapes stuff that I hadn't heard, and there's like one that needed a new vocal, so I said, George, send me the tapes, I'll put a new vocal on it, you know, but he was the one responsible. We had such a uh, understanding, uh, you know, and they'd say, you know, George, put, put a little, you know, put, put a little effect on this at this certain part of the song, you know, and uh, yeah. I'm gonna have well, to dig I, in. I, that's that. that to me. Clint that's Burton a massive. Re again, that's a massive you know? revelation. A massive revelation. Yeah. And so, and I, Cliff get, is is has influenced everybody. You know, he's a genius. Too. So, he's like, genius. if it ever yeah. gets out, uh, you heard it here first. I put the pieces together. I, I would I would buy that because I <laughs> I got that feeling that the the Metallica guys were those when they were in high school. 
you know, which is just such a, a, an important part of your development as a musician. And you go formative years, yeah. And you're sitting in the front row, and you're singing a band that's crazy as Blue Oyster Cult do their thing, you know, which we developed over months and months and months of of touring. And you know, sometimes right. those solos would be just. Uh, I would look forward to them because it was that one moment that I could just get out there on a, you know, everybody else gets to get out there on a limb. You're totally you going know, off on chance. this. I mean, it was take a good a night. You have to go take back and watch it. And, and uh, yeah, I don't have a copy of that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, you have to watch it. It's amazing. I may have to um, dig that out of the, the archives. It was actually filmed here outside of D.C. in Landover, oh, Maryland. Oh, yeah, Landover. Yeah. At the Capitol Center, oh, yeah. this famous, the yeah. <laughs> I remember um, that now. Oh, that was good. You know, because they put that, a beautiful video system in there that was mm. intended for uh, hockey games. They, you know, they, they had multi, I don't know where they got the money, but it was like, you know, all the best equipment and a great, great uh, cameraman. So we went in there and, and uh, they, they were, they said, yeah, let's, 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 uh, we, we'll record your show. Um, you know, five hundred dollars. <laughs> five hundred. We'll do the. We'll do the whole show. We didn't know. It said, "Okay, five hundred dollars. We'll pay." And and uh, they were so bored with the hockey games that when it came to doing a rock show, they went crazy. They had all these mm. like chroma key stuff that they could put in, and we had the big laser show at that time too. Mm. Huge lasers. So oh, we're yeah. getting not only you know uh, video effects you know, for the video toaster or whatever the, whatever the, uh, whatever that device was at the time, but it was all high quality and, and it, for 500 bucks and with sound too, everything. And, uh, yeah, Capital Center show. We went back in there a few other times. And I have the other one from 76. They, they wanted more Cap money Capital. for one thing. They wanted more money. <laughs> right. They were going to give us a deal like that. And, uh, and also they were, I think they were a little bored with the, 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 uh, the bells and whistle by that time, you know, I don't know, you know, or, uh, I'm sure there's other really good shows that were recorded in that room, but we loved it. We loved it. We loved we're probably it. Probably sitting on a treasure trove of that stuff. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Definitely. Um, there's another, I wanted to go back real quick because, um, I, I do a bit of treasure hunting here at the thrift stores and stuff. You never know what you're going to sure. find. And some years back, I found this. Do you know what this is? Demon Hunter. Yeah. I, I do you know I what know this what is? That. Yeah. Do you know what's in here? Transman icon? No. I found it about 10, like 15 years ago, and I was like, wow, this looks really cool. And I opened it up. And at the very, it says this. Can you read that? Harvester of Eyes, yes. It says the harvest. I was like, holy shit, oh, what's that? Wow. And at the very bottom That's right, cool. it says dedicated to Buck Dharma and the boys. And I was like, yoink, that's mine. <laughs> wow. So like another Demon weird, Hunter. like just I've little. I've seen it. There's a, there's a couple others. Uh, there's a Marvel yeah. one, but yeah. this, this is Atlas. Yeah, nice. the one where you guys are sitting around the roulette yeah, yeah, wheel, yeah. right? Yeah, yes, I've I've seen that one. I've got this, this one's a little more obscure, I think. Wow, Harvester of Eyes, the Excellent. Harvester of Eyes. Excellent. Um, yeah, I wanted to also, you know, I wanted to go back and talk about, um, you know, you were talking about producers and all that. For me, obviously, I'm I'm a, I'm a hard rock. I was a hard rock metal kid. Uh, mm -hmm. Love Mark Birch, Burke, yeah. and um, so that whole period. I mean, he actually does a couple of albums with you guys: a Cult of Source, yes. Erectus, Cult Fire of Under Origin. Origin. Fire and, Origin. But um, well, yeah, what was it like working with him? I oh, mean, he great. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you is like when you first saw Sabbath. I mean, so. Were you like into that? Were you into heavy music or did you be get into heavy music or it was had it a just more tone? It had a tone that was different. 
I would say, mm-hmm. you know, you know, it, like it Sabbath, when you saw Tony Iommi play and like geezer play. Yeah. I didn't know that he had things where his fingers were cut off. And that's, that's why he played all of those, those bar chord or those, those power chords. Oh, the, yeah. Yeah. He had right. plastic tips on his fingers. He so invented that, that sound because it's weird. Of that. And we toured with them and I didn't even know it until like later when I found out mm-hmm. that that inflected his, his style on the, on the guitar. But I right. think it was the whole, the whole band had uh, insight into you know we, we we you know they were a, a a failed blues band you know yeah called earth or something yeah earth and the, the they were, yeah blues and, band. And, you know and as soon as they figured out that song which was the song black sabbath mm-hmm. everything changed i mean it was just the the crowd would go crazy it was just the right song at the right time and it was the right, right. tone at the right time no, that's I, didn't that think was, I didn't think that was, yeah, that's right. Um, the devil's music, the music. The devil's music. Diabolus of Musica. <laughs> yeah. Diabolus right. of Musica. Yeah, no, but I, uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. You know, it, you know when, they, when they jammed, it was always that energy jam, you know. Mm-hmm. We, we, had, we explored a lot of different, you know, ways of improvising you know, in the early days. And that was just another, another thing, another, uh, another thing in your toolkit. If you were improvising music to have the power chords and the, you know, the heavy stuff. And it was kind of like, kind of like, um, uh, Led Zeppelin, you know, they used sure. the power chords too, you know? So no, I didn't think it was that, that, that far removed. It certainly was something that we could do, you know, uh, have some fun with. Well, it's funny, yeah. you know, that, that came up as well because I have something else to show you. Oh, what's in the and box? And it is what's in the bag. <laughs> this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the Black, the Black and, Blue, and Blue, Tour. Blue Tour. This has never been officially released. This is a bootleg. But um, it's Tony amazing. Tony doesn't want it released. Tony Who? doesn't want it released. Tony. Which oh, he doesn't. I think, oh, okay. Well, through Sharon and Sharon says uh, they they don't oh, like Ozzie their performance on that. Or who yeah. Have, yeah, yeah, she um, she controls that. This is incredible. Um, so I mean, so what was the tour like? I, Dio's my favorite singer of all time. You He's know, a I, great I, singer. I, I go back really... to high school with him. I saw really? him play. I saw him play in Ithaca. He's from Cortland, which is like twenty miles from Ithaca. And I would see him all through my college career. He had Ronnie uh, and the Red uh, Caps. Uh, uh, well, I didn't see the Red Caps, but I saw the Prophets. Ron, okay. Ronnie Dio and the Prophets a lot. And then they wow. became the Elves. The that is incredible. The You're blowing my yeah. mind right now. <laughs> oh, all the time. And I did a gig with him with my little Latin jazz band at a club in Ithaca. And he played up in the loft of this place called the North 40. Uh, yeah, and we, we, we're playing our little soft, easygoing jazz stuff, and he's up there. He's rocking uh, it out with the prophets. Uh, what's it? Yeah, a great drummer he had too. Yeah, so, yeah. So, uh, so I had followed Gary, you know, uh, uh, Ronnie, uh, Ronnie all through uh, all through high school. He played up in Watertown, New York, where I was from. So when you saw him finally pop up with the with Elf and all that, you were like, yeah, "Oh, I know that know, guy." He, he always had the voice. The voice. Oh was my God. Always there, so you knew. Magical. You knew that. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah, and 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 eventually he definitely you could tell he had the ambition, you know. Mm. Um, but it did blow my mind when he joined Black Sabbath. I mean, Rainbow was one thing, you know. Oh yeah. You know. Rainbow is like okay, he's moved up a step. You know, he's on the he's on the thing. Next thing you know, whoa, he's in Black Sabbath. You know, so Massive. yeah. And we would we would talk. We it was a, it was a little difficult tour for us because uh, I I just love the guy and I love those guys and like let's have some fun on this tour. But they were in a bad mood, you know. You know, mm. you know Bill Ward left the tour with, without an announcement. 
He just oh wow. We were out in Colorado or something. He just said, "I don't want to do this anymore." And got in his Winnebago and took off. So they had to get a drummer in like you know two days. They had to get a new drummer. So they got Vinny, uh, you know, Vinny Apsey. He's a great drummer. So mm, so the okay. tour started with Bill Ward and ended with Vinny Apsey. But we had tremendous shows. That the one that on, that's on that DVD was our stomping grounds, which was the uh, Long Island, uh, you know, uh, Nassau. Oh, Coliseum. Na- Nassau Coliseum. Nassau, Nassau Coliseum, great place. We s- played there a, long, a lot of shows. Kiss, uh, um, you know, I I can't remember the first one we played there, but we would play there quite a bit, and. Uh, and, and then and it wasn't bad that, that we felt like competitive with Black Sabbath because, you know, we would go. I heard say, there was a little tension. Yeah, there was tension, but I think it was a good tension for us, but it kept us on our toes. You know, mm. we said, we got to be as good as we can possibly be because we don't want to get into any of this politics, you know, or, or you know, dispute about this or that. Who go, Who's going to who's gonna close the show, you know? Or can you start your show on time? You know, there was all these kind of issues of like, well, you know, you guys just played, so we're going to wait two hours before we do our set. What? You know, come on. You know, we got to do another one tomorrow and then the day after that. You know, every day was a different, different set. Oh, it was, a, it was a co-headlining thing. Yeah, co-headlining. Because we're supposed to switch. It. Eventually, okay. we just got tired of, of waiting for them to go on and for us to go on late. We just said, well, we'll go on early. We don't care. We know that we're better. <laughs> we know that we're better. That's funny. <laughs> well, we, we delivered a, a kind of a different kind of show. It was a little more, you know, campy, I guess, maybe a little more rock and roll, you know. And they were definitely deep deep in the dark stuff, deep in the dark stuff. I remember, yeah, we had a riot. We had a riot that destroyed the hall in milwaukee and we were banned from milwaukee for like i don't know forever i think we're still banned <laughs> wow this is 1980 so 1980 we did we went we went on first okay we didn't mind did our show it really went off well pat blows the uh, arena was packed so i go back to the hotel and i'm watching johnny carson or something you know late night tv and I hear a siren. Well, you know, so we're in a big city. You hear sirens all the time. Then I hear like two sirens. Then I hear like ten sirens. Then I hear like fifty sirens. Holy shit! What is going on? So finally, the crew comes back to the hotel and says, "Yeah, they had a you know, somebody threw something on stage, mm-hmm. and, it, and it hit Geezer. So he." He left the stage, and they refused to play. So the next uh-huh. thing you know, every you know, had detachable chairs. They threw all the chairs, destroyed the stage. Our stuff was all packed up and in the truck and out of there. But all the stuff was, like, completely destroyed. Mob uh, rules, right? Mob rules. That was it. The mob <laughs> rules. If you listen to fools, the oh, mob rules. Mob rules. <laughs> I'm going to try a new one, Devil Hornborn, and our new lead singer, Johnny Perth. Here we go. go. Alright, come on, Johnny. It's up to you now, son.
I wanted Ooh. to ask you about the heavy metal soundtrack. Yeah. Because both of you guys are on it. Unbelievable. Sabbath. Unbelievable. Well, we spent, and Sabbath. We had higher hopes for this album. And and I'm really happy because it's one of my gold albums. It's on the wall in my trophy room. Uh, sure. You know, but it's a gold album, not because of Black Sabbath or Blue Oyster Cult. It's a gold album because Journey is on it. And they had the sappiest love song. Right. Open arms. Right. Da, 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 well, it's da, the, da, da. I mean, it's every, all the bands. I mean, it was every, yeah, all I know. the music at the, at you, the time. You would expect, you know, it, I don't think our manager played the sort of game that you have to play to get your songs on a soundtrack. He, he, he didn't, he loved doing it, but we worked hard all year because we wanted to do the whole album. We wanted to do the whole album. I mean, maybe they would have had, you know, a couple others. I had a song that I wrote called Fallen Angel. They said it was definitely going to be the opening cut of the movie. Mm. And then the next thing you know, Don Felder gets the song. And why Don Felder? Because Irving Azoff, you know, made a deal with the... Yeah, oh, there's like the Eagles connection. And he connection. had Stevie Nicks, and they brought in Steely Dan. I mean, I actually I love the Steely Dan track that's on that thing. Uh, but they wanted to mix it stuff, up with the rock, was, the heavy, yeah, and the rock, and you know, it, it was a good mishmash, you know, and, yeah. and maybe it wouldn't have worked. But our album, which is called Fire of Unknown Origin, probably about six or eight of those songs were targeted to that movie, you know. I, I know, and you can hear it. Vengeance, you can the hear pact. it. Yes, I Take was about to bring that up. Vengeance, the we, pack. You can had, hear it. You hear the lyrics, and you see the movie. Yeah, 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 yeah. Someday somebody is going to edit that all together and make a new edit of that with with they our should. Show. But Albert was knew the some of the cartoonists. My brother, he knew some of the mm -hmm. cartoonists that were working on it. They sent us a full storyboard, you know, with all the characters written and drawn. So we went to our rehearsal room in the city, and we had all of these characters, the, the storyboard of the, of the movie, laid out in our rehearsal room. Say, okay, we're going to write a song for this scene. We'll write a song, Don't Turn Your Back, was, was mm -hmm. one of them. That was de definitely for, for the... Uh, for the uh, cab driver, the taxi driver scene. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was, I mean, it was good to have a, uh, a strong, yeah, that's the album. It right. was good to have a strong theme that, that was sort of drawing us all in the same direction. So about, and, yeah, you can uh, tell that, that this is basically the soundtrack to yeah, that album. Like you said, there's about eight songs on here. Right, that could so, easily Soul Survivor. Have, Heavy yeah, metal, yeah. black and silver. Black and silver, heavy metal. Black and silver. Yeah. Yeah. Don't turn so, it back after yeah, dark. Yeah. Learning for you. Yeah. You know, it was a good time. It was a good time. We, you know, and and we we did get. Did you go track see the movie out. when it came and that's, out? And it, uh, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, hmm. And I got bootlegs of it over the years. <laughs> I had I, when I was I was teaching in a private school for a while, and some of my students at the private school became who was a, a cartoonist that was obsessed by that movie, and he couldn't believe that that I had anything to do with it. I said, "Yeah, I can show you the storyboard, how it was developed, and everything. You know, we have the script, we have the whole script right here." Um, that was, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean. I kind of wish we did more movie stuff, you know. That's that's always uh, a good thing, but uh, it's oh. it's difficult to play the Hollywood game. Oh, Halloween was huge. Halloween is okay. No, okay. Reaper, don't fear the Reaper is one of those songs. If you go through like uh, what is it, the All Music Guide or something, and you 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 type in search, and there's like seventy five different uses of Don't Fear the Reaper. In TVs, video game, TV shows, video games, movies. We had a well, actually just recently, uh, Career of Evil was a 
uh, song that was the third single that Blue Oyster Cult put out from Secret Treaty's album. Mm. And J.K. Rowling wrote a novel called Career of Evil. Oh. And every time, this is, the, she She doesn't say it's J.K. Rowling because she she doesn't want to lose her uh, fan base, her, her Harry Potter, you know, gold mine. Uh, but she wrote Career of Evil under an assumed name, Robert Galbraith. And it's a uh, murder mystery, a murder mm. mystery. And every chapter of the book, is a Blue Oyster Cult song. And even there's Blue Oyster Cult songs that were never even put out, that it were just demos, that she found out the titles of these things. And wow, you know, I did put not in know book. that. That's she sent amazing. Us, yeah, she sent us uh, autographed copies of the book. She was very nice. I, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll get to see her. Maybe I'll meet her. I know Patty That's... Smith, who is, we've been associated, met her, and she's a big fan of Patty and, so that may be how Career of Evil, because uh, Patty wrote the lyrics for Career of Evil. It was one of the oh, okay. first I things that you. Blue Oyster Cult, Cult recorded with Patty, uh, of hers that we recorded. So, uh, yeah. Well, I have, I have a. I how mean, you I have can't a whole make this other... stuff up. It's great. It's I know. Great stuff. I have a whole it's bunch great. of other stuff here, but I'm, I, I have one more DVD. I wanted to wrap up the DVDs real quick sure. because I have something. You might not be familiar with this movie. It came out around the same time as Days and Confused, about a year or so later. So maybe it kind of got. I know which one you're talking about. Stoned Age. Stoned Age. You know this? It's <laughs> yeah. awesome. You can't see it, but there's a on the cover of his car. There's a shepherd's crook. Oh but the, yeah. The BOC yeah. shepherd's BOC crook, side. and sure. One Most of the main exactly. characters yeah. goes to a BOC show, and what happens to him? Yeah, I know. I know. Do you I'm remember what happened? I'm in there for about 30 seconds. Okay. In, there's a, there's a, there, and we kind of wondered where did they get the, where did they get the footage? You know, and I, we found out that we have a, a fan club in Los Angeles. And mm. the guy had a, he had some 16 millimeter reels of some of our live shows. So that's, he, he let them borrow it. We never, mm. we never got paid for it. <laughs> right but what can i say it's the the movie is a hoot you know it's awesome yeah. and one of the main characters what he goes blind or he has like this spiritual yeah. epiphany yeah, from get, getting blind by the lasers at lasers the, yes, the cult yes. show <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's can't awesome make this stuff up you can't make super it up. psychedelic man and awesome yeah super psychedelic well those were the days yeah it was around right the, uh, dazed and confused time you know Right. Yeah. Um, well, I do. I do have a couple uh, more question, questions here, real sure. quick. Um, so, the whole MC Five thing. I had obviously when that out that the live album came out, people were like MC Who. So you guys were already kind of on top of that whole high energy hard rock thing. Yeah. Um, so were you guys fans of them back then? Yeah, actually, they were on Electra Records when soft white underbelly was there they oh, were on Electra. Okay. there you go and i just joined the band when that you know kick out the jams was mm. released i just joined that and i went up to eric's room in the band house and he had a whole stack of 45s <laughs> and he'd say hey it's kick out the jams and he'd say i think this record needs sharpening <laughs> Those those records are probably worth you know like big bucks today. No, right. this needs sharpening. So he he had stucco walls. So he <laughs> he'd take the record, and scrape it on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I wonder I wonder if anybody has any of those left. But they would go to Electra in New York, and the office, and say, "Here, here's the new thing." They did. MC5 just came out, you know. Here, take a big stack of records, you know. Oh, Plenty, you know, he did it, it cuz it was he was just goofing yeah, around. But, or... Yeah, free they were free uh, free uh promotional records. Oh, okay. And, you know, tons of them, you know. Like kick out the jams, they, you want to kick out the jams, all... I'll give you some kick I mean, out the jams. We'd give anything for a new record, you know. We didn't have mm -hmm. very many records at the house. 
and uh, they would they would uh, raid the raid the uh, the 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 uh, cupboards at uh, Electra, and and MC5 was one of them. So I remember that very well from those days. First day, first day I was in the band it was. Uh, so MC5. you got you were you were into that sound then. Yeah, that high yeah, energy sure. rock. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, there was a censored version, and then there was an uncensored version. I have Whoa, the uncensored version. <laughs> <laughs> that's the hard get one away to with get. that yeah yeah so i i think maybe 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 uh maybe electra said do the uncensored ver if you're gonna do any stuff like this do the uncensored version no well, i don't know i really i I, I have to ask because i i'm in dc and there's this uh the scene that's been around for 40, almost 50 years now called the, the doom scene, the doom metal scene. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, um, it all started here. There was a band called Pentagram that started that scene. Yeah. They were one of the first bands to start the whole black Sabbath sound, yeah. Yeah. uh, besides black Sabbath to take that sound and yeah. to really embrace it. Yeah. And, um, a bit of a legendary guy around here, Bobby Liebling. Um, uh -huh. But I heard that there is some rumors, some tales that back in the late 70s, because, you know, Sandy was always in, he was into the Sabbath and he was looking for the next like Sabbath type band. Next Sabbath, you find a Sabbath. So, yeah, it doesn't get much yeah. more Sabbathy than that, that he was going to manage them. And there are some demos. I don't know if you're familiar with that or oh, if you have any yeah. stories about what that. What was the name or... of the band? Pen Pentagram. Pe Pentagram. Yeah, I heard about those guys. Okay. I don't know. I don't think I ever heard heard the demos. Okay. Yeah. So what happened? Well, they to ended them? up they ended up you know releasing albums and they're a bit of a, a bit of local legends. They mm -hmm. like I said, they kind of started the whole along with, of course, Black Sabbath invented the doom metal sound. But yeah, sure. Pentagram was the first band to really embrace that yeah. sound over yeah. here in the states. And um, I was just curious if you had any heard any tales or knew anything about Sandy's no, association. You know, I I, I think I heard the name and I th maybe heard that Sandy was looking at this band. I don't, right. Maybe maybe he just didn't. Maybe they just didn't click. You know. Well, uh, 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 the story is that Bobby wanted to redo a vocal and he they, he got hot uh, in the studio and there was some friction and Sandy was like. I can't work with lunatics or something like that. <laughs> it was one of those things, uh, uh, you know, and he was already managing a couple of bands. Yeah. Uh, you guys into dictators, right? The dictators. Yeah. Di yeah. Spent a lot, Which he, spent a lot of time. Your brother Al is currently in. Yes. I wanted to mention that. I did get to see him last year at the heavy metal hall oh, of fame. Oh, oh great. Yeah. And, I'm hoping that the the dictators will tour coming up. I definitely want to check yeah. that out. Um, uh, they 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 have definitely uh, got some things happening. Yeah, they're in a studio, that. and hopefully yep, they'll studio. work and yep. they'll come to the D.C. area. Yeah, yeah. Um, lots of good, lots of great songs that they've they've had over the years. Which one? Oh, I don't know. The party starts now. <laughs> oh, oh, the dictators. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I thought you said. I thought you said they're yeah. working on some new stuff. Yeah. That you... Let's get the band back together. One of my favorites. Let's right. get the band back together. <laughs> Like a flood 
Obviously, a work with or collaborated with or played shows with, you know, countless musicians. Who, who are the ones that stand out either from a, a, you know, musicianship perspective or just songwriting perspective? The, the, the artists that you go, these, these were geniuses of, of, that, of that era. Hmm. Well, there's been a lot, you know. Um, hmm. How about yeah. this guy? Yeah, Jimmy. <laughs> Jimmy. I didn't get to see Jimmy. But uh. before I was in the band, they were the house band at the scene in New York. Jimmy came in one night and wanted to jam on their equipment. And I think um, uh, Elvin Bishop and, and Jimmy was going to play bass. And I'm, I'm sure he didn't have a left-handed bass, probably played it upside down. So Jimmy asked Buck Dharma, if he could use his amp when it was just came wow. out from repairs too it was this fender twin and he was going to play bass through a fender twin and uh don said to him well you can play through the fender twin but just don't turn it up too loud <laughs> <laughs> jimmy just don't turn it up too loud <laughs> he's a volume freak <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. No, no. And he actually kept it down. And the, and the amp was in good shape when he finished with it. And, um, yeah, we, we used that amp for quite a while. And then, then it got destroyed in a, uh, we had a building collapse on it. And we don't know where, even where the parts are. We should have saved those parts. You know, Jimmy played through this amp, you know. Well, so he um, did, he did only play the bass though? Yeah, he only played the bass through it. Yeah. That is wild. It so, was a jam so he didn't you know, play the guitar that night. He played I, the bass. No, just played the bass. In fact, I just saw a picture of him playing the bass with um uh Johnny Winter at the same place at the at the scene. Oh, that famous bootleg. Club, the famous club, yeah. Yeah. At uh at the scene, you know. A lot of a lot of people would come in there. Ringo Starr came in one night and and Albert was I woke up and found myself dead. Yeah. <laughs> you ever heard that bootleg? No, no, no. That's the one with Jimmy and Johnny Winter on it and Jim mm. Morrison. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that was the kind of scene that they they were part of the scene at the scene uh, in New York before I That's joined amazing. the band. I, I went there a couple of times and I saw. Oh, the New York rock and rock and roll ensemble, which is interesting classical guys that that uh, they had a long career, and then uh, I saw a band from Boston called the Wild Thing mm. <laughs> at uh, at the scene. Yeah, we we, we uh, <clears throat> had a good time there. Good time in those old days, you know. Just, just Who, see what wanted, was going on. You know? I. One of the things I did want to ask you that I forgot was like, um, because a couple of my other favorite songs are Nosferatu and um, Fire, of Unnor Fire of Unknown Origin Unknown and Origin, Shadow yes. of California. So yes. do, you, do you have a favorite song that you wrote? Well, I, I got to say Astronomy, you know, because it did so well. You know, the Metallica yeah. version is, I think they did a brilliant job with it. Oh, yeah. You know, I get chills when I hear when i hear uh lars's bass drum come in at the beginning mm -hmm. and i'm like oh i can blow my mind and then james james is he's starting to sound like eric bloom <laughs> <laughs> just for oh, a second yeah, he... just for a second if I, if I if i suspend my my reasoning and i say that's eric bloom no it's james hatfield oh, my god yeah so I'm, right. I'm i'm happy about that and you know, um, what, what about live? What's did you have a favorite band that you ever played with live? Oh my god, like Cheap Trick. With? I like Cheap Trick, you know. Um, they, oh, they that would have been they fun. Were, they were they were great in the early days. They had power 45 minutes of just incredible energy and mm. and the great guys. Um, Alice Cooper, the Alice Cooper Killer Tour was. Wow. brilliant you know and uh i get to do some of those songs now i you know i get to, we 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 have we revisit those days sometimes every time halo of flies i did that we did that with neil and dennis for a long time so yeah um those are uh yeah some of the great ones you know uh you know a lot of times when we were on tour I know there were some great bands, but I try to uh, concentrate on what, you know, getting my headspace in doing my best performance. If I see somebody else mm. playing really good before me, I'll say, oh, God, I can't do this. Oh, I, <laughs> I can't you. follow those guys. So sure. I, I would tend, tend to uh, avoid, you know, really getting into the uh, the opening act things. But, you know, we played some great shows. You know, early heart shows were great. You oh, know, we played cool. with Jeff Beck. You know, nice. fantastic. You know. Did you ever play with Rush? Uh, oh, tons of times. We had a whole They're my favorite band, a, band of all time. 2120. I love those guys. 20, we did the whole 2120 tour. They were our 2112. opening 2112. 2112. I'm sorry. Right. I'm, I'm a couple of decades off. <laughs> but but uh no we, we we were good friends with them and in fact my roadie went on to be getty's roadie and uh jack seek my favorite band i i worship jack, those jack guys Seek. they're oh, amazing yeah 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 
Well, I like, you know, I, you know, and I said, okay, I'm going to be honest with you. I heard him and I said, I don't know if this group is ever going to make it. You know, they got <laughs> sure. scratchy sounds. They're only three piece. They'll never, they'll never fill out the stage. Right. Boy, was I wrong. Boy, right. was I wrong. And I get, then I got to see them do their whole thing with like the synth, you know, beautiful synth right. stuff. And uh, yeah, like. And Getty was a you know, monster. And then they would do, but then they would do the the three piece things, and that was amazing right. too. That, that, that to me was even more exciting than you know having banks of synthesizers, you know, playing. Oh like yeah, that. doing the and cream, then and then I cream. like I like the songs, the middle period songs, you know, mm -hmm. you know the uh, the big money and oh my god, you know. And Getty himself was—he's an amazing player. You know, I mean, it's not—it's not what the hardcore fans think is the best, but to me, I like, have it all. The so. development—the <laughs> development of that band. The, this goes from, you know, uh, the oh, the evolution, the evolution oh, yeah. of the band, you know, to you know, Spirit of the Radio and Free Will, and like, oh my God, they were just like kicking on all cylinders. They're really serious guys really mm -hmm. they were really serious guys they they really you know they they would had they had their own they had their own sort of uh you know they were kind of like the beatles you know the beatles talk about well you know there was all this madness going around but we as a group with the four of us you know but i think it was like there would be all this craziness and rock tours and stuff but there was always this core of three guys that had their little intellectual like a you know, family they, family like thing and mm. and and that probably made a big big influence on how they developed you know as a band you know and even they got to the big more proggy stuff later and you know you sure. know i maybe a, a few things that i wasn't crazy about but boy was i wrong when i said i don't know if they'll ever make it <laughs> Well, he, he's a monster. To get. He's a Sometimes, monster bass player. Yeah, oh, yeah, Getty's fantastic. on the on the Rickenbacker. He, he had a monster yeah, sound. Yeah. And how about that Neil Pert guy? Well, and he wrote the lyrics a, too. He's a genius. A genius. Yeah, yeah. Miss him. All right. Well, well I, yeah. I just wanted to say um, one last thing. That uh, where to go? That. Go check out this everyone out there go check this out yeah go, go, go check out joe's bass solo and then go listen to this album <laughs> you heard it here first make the connection it'll blow your mind uh, um that joe was a heavy influence that. on cliff burden and metallica and um i think i think that's it did you have have any last words for your fans out there joe I just say, uh, check out my uh, solo stuff. Come to my website, joebouchard.com. I got 400 videos on YouTube. Um, <clears throat> doing new videos all the time. I just started doing TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Grandpa's doing TikTok. <laughs> right. Yeah. I got to get hip with what the young kids are into. No. Right. I started making vi vertical videos. I mean, you know. I, I do the whole video thing, you know. Uh, last this, this album before this, I did a video for every song on my last album. And uh, I'm, I'm still working on it. And, you know, the times are changing. You know, you got to, you know, there, there might be something out there in it. I don't know, you know, but I'm having fun. I'm having well, I'm time. looking forward to you guys coming. The yeah. Bouchard Brothers, okay. I'll be there. If you come to the yeah. D.C. area, I'll definitely well, be that's there. Great. And that's great. And yeah. I'm, just, I'm curious about, you sure. talked about new media. Is is it because when, when I listened to American Rocket, it was on Bandcamp. And that I, my association with Bandcamp is bands that have zero profile. So what's your experience being with Bandcamp, mm -hmm. you know, with someone who does have a profile? I think three albums ago I had some stuff on Bandcamp and I and I sort of experimented with Bandcamp put some some um, covers that nobody has heard but it's it was fun to sort of experiment with it but I, I there's just so many avenues for that stuff so I can't really keep up with it you know um maybe I'll get back into it but like I said today I'm into TikTok 
tomorrow the world oh grandpa's into tiktok today <laughs> right yeah, it's funny it's funny we're having but i like i said i have fun with it and uh, you know and i'm 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 just seeing if anybody's entertained you know but uh there's a lot of good stuff on my website you know and you can find a well it's a real a, honor a story and it's a real honor to have you on here. And in, in fact, um, we're probably going to have your brother on, Al, on in oh, a few months. <laughs> excellent. Yeah. So that'll excellent. be awesome. It'll be like we a can perfect. tell you like, all about the tour. Yeah. Shadow tell us California. about everything. I was, I was just practicing that for the tour today. Before before this interview, I was uh, practicing the new version, a new version of Shadow of California. And right on. Pretty, it's Can't very wait. cool. Yeah, I hope yeah, you guys yeah. come to the D.C. area, and yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, so um, it's, it's great having you along. Down the down the highway, we'll be down there. I'll we'll I'll be, be there. there. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. Sure, and I just have one last thing to say. Remember, sure. look to the stars, carry that torch of enlightenment, and strive to be a disciple of rock and roll in the Brotherhood of Orpheus. You got it. You got it. You got right it. Right on. Thanks so much, guys. My name's Willie J. I'm with the Bad Boys, and thanks for sticking around.
crowd. Where's the bad books? And we'll see you next time. Thank you all very much. Stick around for Jack Owen and the Dead Crows. <laughs>